want. Now, that ain't no way to greet visitors. Just keep on riding. I don't think so, ma'am. We're gonna stay for a while. Dog in this gang will hire, terrorize, and kill anybody that get in their way. I assume you're a lawman? Federal Marshal. You leaving again now? Wherever this dollar ball goes, he leaves trail of bodies behind. Man, women too. Hey, it's Nikia Michelle, and this just in. Joining me today, I have actor, director Isaiah Washington. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. taking the time out to talk to me. Absolutely. We are here at uh, White Smoke and Ash in celebration for your. This is your directorial debut. Yes, it is. With mm -hmm. uh, Core C. Corsicana. Corsicana. That's fine. It's four, it was foreign to me two and a half years ago. I know. I know. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I know. It, um, it's such an interesting story. Did that you see the movie? I did. Oh, you did? I okay. watched it on Sunday. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Okay. Um, about, did you enjoy it? I did. I Thank did. You. I really loved it because I didn't know about Bass Reeves. And I didn't know about Bass Reeves two and a half years ago or Corsicana, the importance of the Corsicana oil boom, which ultimately became Exxon Mobil. I knew nothing about it, which is what attracted me to the story as an actor eventually. I wasn't there to direct it. I, I was a director by default because the original director <clears throat> that had been on the project for four months quit. <clears throat> Bob was fired. I, I don't really know the story. Uh, but he was no longer interested two days before we were shooting. We had a thunderstorm which bought us another extra day, but now we were running to what we call insurance days. So the investor, Evan McNutt, who's also in the movie, was losing money. And I don't want to be a part of anything where people are losing money. I know what it is to lose money, right? So the last thing I wanted to do was uh, have 40 people go home during the COVID shutdown without jobs. So I did the unthinkable. Uh, because I had done so much research, 22, there are five days, not, not knowing what's going on, I continued to research Bass Reeves because he's so, so much information on him. <clears throat> in the book by R.T. Burton, who lives in Illinois, outside of Chicago. Um, this book called A Black Gun Silver Star, which was my blueprint to give you everything that's in the movie about Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves was not the lead, was not the prominent story. I wrote all of that in, and for, you know, I probably had 48 hours of sleep and 21 days of shooting. Oh, wow. And wrote uh, after hours, wrote at lunch, wrote scenes, rewrote things so we could make this original script that was really a 32-day shoot, $8 million budgeted, John Wick in the Woods kind of movie. And I'm like, I don't know who told you you could make this for $300,000, but I need a whole lot more money right, right. <laughs> to get this done. Exactly. And she was like, what? I was like, or I could go home. So double of, more than double of what she was led to believe to get this done um, was, was invested. And it was a, it turned out to be a good idea. Yeah, um, I really, it was educational. I think that a lot of people need to know about Bass Reeves. And you also mentioned um, Will Foster, who was, mm -hmm. I, I saw you on GM this morning. That's correct. And um, you mentioned him and how he was the first black man that created a production. Well, William Foster Production Company here in Chicago in 1910. And also <clears throat> was a mentor and the provider to, for the success of Oscar Michaud, who became technically the first African-American true independent filmmaker that ended up doing what he did so well, four-walling it, taking it to every theater, local theater, that was, that was empty to show these movies where African-Americans could see themselves in a positive way, which offset D.W. Griffith's movie, Birth of a Nation, which was the birth of a narrative. Mm -hmm. is to have all the world be afraid of black men that they're going to rape and fornicate with your white women. And it's like, we're not all checking for your white women like that, dude. We're just trying to live, find education and shelter and have a job to take care of our families. That's not who we are. We could be funny. We could be this. And in fact, we are master. I can't remember the film. You can research it. But he did a, <clears throat> a comedy that the life and times of a... Uh, a uh, railroad conductor and all the kinds of different personalities, quirky personalities that they encounter, be they bigoted, be they biased, but how he dealt with them in a funny way. So much so that <clears throat> they took his style and structure and the Keystone Cops were created out of that. Mm. He never got any credit for it, but if you research the Keystone Cops before uh, 
sound was a huge success in black and white moving pictures. But he never, William Foster never got the credit for that structure for a comedy. Yeah. Yeah, with no sound. I, I, so for I, me to be in Chicago, right. Sam Greenlee, Spook Who Said By The Door, uh, there's just a plethora of great films that have been made here. So I just feel honored that I'm here to show my film as a true independent without major distribution, without major um, uh, marketing plan to get your attention. Right. Uh, like Wakanda, the multi-million dollar. This is, but I'm still competing in the same theaters that all these movies are in. And I'm already told that people are not happy with Avatar 2. So it's great. So good. <laughs> then I, hopefully you show up and convince the owners of Icon, instead of giving me one day, just keep me in the theater so people can have options. Right. It's still entertaining. doesn't matter if you have more than a, a, a black director or a black lead. It's a good movie. Yeah. And it's entertaining. And it's And it can make money. <laughs> and it's, it's part of American history that many people are not aware of that we can all appreciate because it finds a breakthrough line of, of, of commonality. I wrote the character California. Okay. That wasn't in a script. I wrote that because I'm tired of this idea that all white people are inherently evil. <laughs> you got a lot of people that are evil. Right. But not all white people are evil or looking to <laughs> like do us harm. Right. And vice versa. Right. Uh, I just got sick and tired of that. Um, so I want to address that in my way and not spitely you, hit you in the nose, wake up, you know, the man no. is here to kill us. It was, very, it was very you know, chill. It was just, very yeah. chill. <laughs> like, like we're, we're working together, good guys against the bad guys, good guys win, good guys go home. Right. Bad guys die. Right. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. End of story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, Back what, to the basics. One yeah. thing that um, I have to say, you know, through you, like you said, you've been in this industry for 30 years. You know, and I love the fact that you're moving into another well space, like directing. What were between acting and directing? What is the most like challenges on the directing side? Because acting, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're very familiar and comfortable, but directing can be a new territory. Well, it's, I'm not asking for permission from the gatekeepers. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I, I'm I'm very vocal. <laughs> I speak my mind. I'm, I'm loud and proud. Uh, I'm not afraid of a good, you know, holistic debate based on facts. Uh, I've been, I started off as an educator, worked in the private sector, in the military. So I had other experiences before the age of 23 when I was anointed with this opportunity, this gift to become an actor. And I started at the ground floor. I do everything in 10 years. So I never want to be a director, but I want to be a producer because the producer are anonymous. They make money, millions and millions of dollars, and you go beat them, and you never know who they are. I really thought that was cool. So I, my, the, my goal was to just be a producer, but I really feel that this opportunity was just put on me um, because Warren Beatty and Steven Soderbergh and the Clint Eastwoods and Spike Lee always said, that you should be a director. And I was like, no, I don't want to be you. You're an asshole. You, know? <laughs> you, know, well, you treat people bad because you're God. You know, I don't want to be a horrible God. You know, um, but 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 now that I know that yes, you have to be passionate. You have to be a taskmaster. People are not going to like you because they're going to challenge authority naturally. But if you have a vision that other people don't really understand, they're just there for a check. Then yeah, you're going to get pushback. But ultimately, you know, you know, we all win in the end because the leader has to be a leader. And we just have a generation now that there's very little respect for elders, very little respect for true leaders. Everything has to be debated. Everything has to be challenged. And I just realized <coughs> that. And he skipped in one second. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Was it over? Did she just wrap us? I guess so. But, but ultimately, my goal was to change the, the narrative of how you perceive directors uh, and occupy, occupy a space that many people are not comfortable with. If you notice, George Tillman, Spike Lee, Antoine Fuqua, uh, most of our African-American directors are treated horribly in, in the press. Not because they're not talented, it's because they're a uh, viable competition for a limited amount of very valuable resources. And that's, that, that's not racism, that's just human nature, is that I don't want to have to compete with someone who I think they could do it better than I. So the fact that I'm on the outside of the system competing in the same theater, 
I don't have, the, I'm not beholden to the gatekeepers. And that's going to probably, you know, turn a lot of people off because it's like he's not going through us. We can't control him. The people are listening to him. He has a, vo a voice. He has a, I mean, but that has to change like anything. Slavery was, they had laws for slavery, right? And eventually people stood up against it and it changed. So I feel like I'm a disruptor. That it's time to make a change where everyone can sit at the table and participate in this wealth building. Yes, absolutely. Um, it seems that we're getting wrapped, but I do yeah. want to say that um, I really, my favorite movie that you were in. Don't I say love jokes. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Well, how about that? I have Look to. Look at that. I almost got fired off of that because I refused to cut my locks. Uh -uh. Oh, no, I had the producer come in my trailer with clippers that said, I've never seen a professor at Northwestern, Uni Northwestern University look like you, and I'm coming here to cut th your locks. And I said, did you pack a lunch? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to keep these locks 25 years. My people going to have locks, and it's not going to be an issue because our hair shouldn't dictate what's in our heart, what's in our intellect, and what's in our spirit. Yes. So I've almost been fired fighting for us, not just black people, but all of us with a heart. Um, to do the right thing, yes. not to be corny like Spike Lee, but that's what I've been doing. And I'm going to keep doing it as long as I can. I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. appreciate it. And you. I hope everybody goes and sees the film. Whether and they do or not, it's going to end up on Amazon one way or the other. I know, and they'll be watching it. And then just a quick photo, and then I'll, I'll, uh, all right, I'll, I'll let you it. get out. Let's do it. Let's do it. But well, we, we definitely been wrapped. They, they wrapped us cold-blooded. Cold-blooded. They, 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 they wrapped us like ABC. <laughs> Let us know.